Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the CRA event today. We appreciate everyone joining for our discussion. I'm Matt Pietrakowski with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CR Consortium with Aid Environment and Profundo. We provide sustainability risk analysis for investors, banks, and NGOs. Today, we'll be discussing the changing palm oil market in Indonesia and why deforestation rates there have fallen in recent years. New research from CRR shows that deforestation in Southeast Asia, connected to the development of oil palm plantations, has fallen to its lowest level since 2017. In 2021, 19,000 hectares of forest and peat were cleared for oil palm plantation development in this region, down sharply from 90,000 hectares in 2019. As in previous years, most deforestation has occurred in, in, in Indonesia. Eight of the 10 largest deforesters in 2021 are developing concessions in Indonesia. The declining deforestation rates for oil palm in Indonesia are promising, but recent government action, increased demand for biofuels, and higher crude palm oil prices all risk more forests being cleared. In our discussion today, the audience will be on mute. If you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A function, and we will try and get to them during the Q&A after the presentations. Our speakers today will be the Southeast Asia team from Aid Environment and special guest Ian, Mor Ian Morris of the Gecko Project. Now I'll hand it over to Chris Wiggs of Aid Environment. Thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about the deforestation that can be attributed to palm oil um, that has reached a four-year low in 2021 and some of the reasons behind that, what's likely going to happen, and just some of the sort of contexts and uh, trends that we're seeing in the sector at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. So Aid Environment has been monitoring deforestation within oil palm concessions for about 15 years. Um, and since 2018, we've been publishing this um, as part of our, our role in the Chain Reaction Research Consortium. Um, and when we first published the report of the top 10 deforesters, um, you could see that there was over 70,000 hectares of deforestation that we could confidently attribute to um, known oil palm concessions. And that rose in 2019 to about 90,000 hectares uh, before seeing a pretty sharp decline in 2020 to just under 40,000. And at the time, we weren't really sure what that was. We kind of assumed it was to do with um, the very, very wet uh, 2020 um, in Indonesia and COVID. Um, so we were quite interested to see what would happen in 2021, and it fell uh, even further, um, which, is, which is a really good development. Um, everyone's you know, quite happy about that. And there's been lots of discussion about what a positive thing this is for Indonesia. Um, but yeah, we're kind of interested in, in sort of the reasons behind it and what it means. So next slide. So if you look at the 10 largest deforesters of 2021, uh, Bengalonjaya Lestari is number one. That's an Indonesian company that uh, has two oil palm concessions in North Kalimantan, and they've cleared uh, just over 3,000 hectares. Uh, the number two company is a group of companies owned by an Indonesian businessman called Salaidi. And Salaidi has been the biggest deforester by far in the last few years. If you look at the 2018, 2019, 2020 list, those companies were number one. But what I find interesting is that when you look at those lists, if you look at the 2018 figures, the Salaidi concessions have cleared about 7,000 hectares as the number one deforester. In 2019, that had gone up to 12,000 hectares. Uh, in 2020, it had fallen to about 6,000 hectares. Um, whereas the number one deforester of 2021 is just over 3,000. So it's much, much smaller. And if you look at the, uh, the companies sort of making up the bottom of the top 10, I think there's five there that are under 500 hectares. So um, it really is quite significant. Declines. It's, it's not a huge amount of deforestation, obviously still too much, but when you consider what it was like a few years ago, these are the biggest deforesters, and some of them are deforesting less than 500 hectares in one year. Uh, next slide. So what does that tell us? What can we 
deduce from that. And there are some trends that we, we see happening year after year. One is that eight of the 10 companies for deforesting in Indonesia, about 16,000 hectares um, of deforestation was in Indonesia last year. So Indonesia is still very much the, um, the hotspot for deforestation. Of the eight companies that we're clearing, six are in Kalimantan, one is in uh, Indonesian Papua, and one is in Sumatra. So it's still the same areas that we're, where we're seeing this deforestation. There hasn't been like a new uh, location that has sort of come up. Um, the most interesting development for me, as someone who's worked in this sector for a long time, is, is how deforestation is increasingly not linked to NDP supply chain. If you think about what the situation was like 10 years ago when um, complaints were being made to the RSPO about um, companies deforesting, um, there were massive campaigns aimed at sort of European, North American consumers because deforestation linked palm oil was ending up in the supply chains of you know, Nestle, Kellogg's, these big well known traders. Um, You've kind of seen with the adoption of NDP policies that, that decrease as companies implement these policies and, and put in measures to sort of remove deforestation linked suppliers. And in, in 2019, about six, six of the top 10 companies could still be linked to international supply chain. In 2020, it was also six. But in last year, the only company that we can really link to any international supply chain was uh, PT Pamakasau at Mandiri, a concession in West Kalimantan that has been deforesting for the last five years. Um, one of our partners had followed um, a truck from the concession to some nearby mills and had identified that it was selling um, fruit to Good Hope, and Good Hope are a big supplier to a lot of companies with NDP policies. When we engaged with Good Hope earlier this year, they announced that they were suspending Pamakasau at Mandiri. So they're no longer purchasing from them. But of the top 10, we can only link one to international supply chain. And that was via an FSB supply to a mill. Um, and there's already been a suspension. So it's a completely different market now to the way it was even a few years ago. Um, much less exposure um, to NDP supply chains. We know much less about these companies, who they're selling to, who owns them. Within that, you are also seeing um, a lot of the same companies appearing year after year. As I said, Salaidi was the, the top deforester for the last few years. Bengalonjai Lestari has been there for a few years. Pamatisau at Mandiri, a lot of people might recognize that concession because it used to be owned by Genting, the Malaysian trader and, and plantation owner. That's been clearing uh, since 2017. You've got the Tanamera project, which has been on a lot of people's radars for many years. It was previously owned by Pacific Interlink. Um, you've got uh, two concessions in North Kalimantan that are part of the Chinese company, Gaia Shuanghua Chemical. They've been deforesting for the last few years. So you've got these um, this changing markets where it's increasingly companies that are not very transparent and you don't know much about them and they're continuing to clear forest. So the strategies that people are implementing to target these companies aren't really working because they're continuing to clear and don't really um, know who they are or, or where they're selling to. And another um, development that's, that's quite interesting and is not something we've really seen before is that a lot of the long-standing deforesters don't have their own mills. So Pomata Salat Mandiri, has been planting palm oil for the last few years, and we know that it is a productive concession. Usually, you would see a, a concession of that size that's about 15,000 hectares with its own mill, but it, it hasn't built a mill. Uh, Bengal and Jaila Stari also doesn't have a mill, as far as we know. Um, so, th there's so much that we don't know about these companies. And one of the challenging things, actually, for COVID, we're, we're often asked what was the biggest challenge. As, as sort of an organization that operates in the field is that we haven't really been able to follow a lot of these trucks. And that's something that we're hoping to do um, this year is that it looks like things get a bit more normal. So we can try and understand a little bit more about um, where these concessions of the Kieran Forest have mature trees, where they might be selling to. 
Um, and that will hopefully give us a little bit more insight into sort of the changing market dynamics of these companies. Uh, next slide. So um, what are the reasons for these declines? There's, there's a lot, there's, there's likely a few. Um, one of the reasons is probably the, the weather. It's been very, very wet in Indonesia in the last um, two years. Uh, this year has been incredibly wet as well. That obviously has an impact in, um, in, in land development. If, if concessions are flooded, as they, as they have been in like parts of West Kalimantan, you can't really develop. Um, likely being linked to COVID, we don't really know the impact of COVID yet, so it will probably become apparent in the next couple of years, but it's, you know, uh, stop work orders, they've all kind of um, had an impact. The proliferation of um, NDP policies has likely had um, an impact, and the lack of forest. You know, there's, there's less deforestation likely because in some areas there's just no forest there. Um, there's a few other reasons. I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Akita, um, because she's going to give a little bit of an overview of some of the ones that we've identified and think um, are quite key. So, Akita. Okay, thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. My name is Akita, and I will talk about some of these possible reasons behind the declines of deforestation within the palm oil concessions. So the government of Indonesia uh, attribute these declines to moratoria. Indonesia has three different regulations aiming at forest and pit forest protection. The first one is forest moratorium, which is still valid until now, although it has undergone some revisions in the past few years. Um, this moratorium bans permits issuance either for agricultural, ag agricultural or mining activities in the area covered by the moratorium. It was started in 2011 and made permanent in 2019. Forest moratorium covers primary forests and pitlands. We can monitor which area is covered by this moratorium through the indicative maps issued by the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. On the, on the other hand, there is palm oil moratorium that has ended in September 2021. It applies only to the palm oil sector and covers cancellation of new licenses for palm oil concessions within forest area. The moratorium also aims to evaluate existing licenses. Unfortunately, unlike the forest moratorium, no maps are, are available for public to evaluate which area are covered by this, by this moratorium. So critics pointed at its lack of transparency. However, many agree that this moratorium has somehow improved the governance of palm oil industry. Both palm oil and forest and both, both palm oil and forest moratorium are in the form of presidential instruction, so we so they lack of like they lack of binding rules and don't don't set certain legal basis for in compliance. And then there we have the pitland regulation. Uh, this regulation has binding rules on pitland clearing, burning, and drainage. It was set and made permanent in 2016 and set a legal basis for in compliance. Next slide. We also think that the part of the reasons of the declines is price fluctuation. So the graph here represents CPO price in US dollar per ton. Looking at the price in the past few years, palm oil, price, palm oil prices have been gradually decreasing in the past few years and then reached a sudden spike in 2020. After that, it fell drastically and steadily increasing. We expected that the drastic fall after 2020, after 2020 correlates with COVID pandemic, where economic situation everywhere seems to be not very stable. The price fluctuation gives companies a sense of instability that they probably don't, don't want to take a risk of doing land clearing. Well, historically, deforestation has been linked to increased palm oil prices. Um, a study found that a price decline of 1% was associated with a 1.08% decrease in new industrial plantations. Next slide. <clears throat> so although we have seen less deforestation within the palm oil concessions in the past few years, the thing is we at CRR don't know the trend with smallholder deforestation because we don't monitor them. Obviously, some smallholders are, uh, 
obviously smallholders are an important part of palm oil sectors in Indonesia. Smallholders have been known to be a growing risk for deforestation. They count for more than 40% of oil palm plantations in Indonesia. Many big palm oil companies also rely on the smallholders for FFB supplies. The mills of the palm oil leaders in Indonesia rely on smallholders for around 14% of their total FFB supply, which with companies like Astra, Agro, Astra Agro Lestari, Bumitama, and Indofood Agri as the prominent ones. On the other hand, a study by Shipor in 2019 reported that smallholders were involved in the conversions of pit soils in Kalimantan. So the common issues with smallholders are they don't receive enough policy support to transform. It's been always difficult with smallholders because we don't have proper maps to monitor them. We don't know exactly the total number of them. Independent smallholders often have limited resources, which resulted in concerns over sustainability. To improve the sustainability of smallholders, they need to receive proper supports in order to improve productivity yield on existing lands. And next slide, I'll pass it to Chris. Thanks, Akita. So, so there's been a few reasons for these declines. As Akita said, it's also linked to government policy. They've undoubtedly had an impact. Um, the prices have been fluctuating. They are increasing now. At the moment, there's a bit of a discussion in Indonesia about um, a crisis with cooking oil. So there's questions about whether um, what impact the rising prices will have. Um, as, as you said, we don't include smallholders in our analysis, and there is deforestation for smallholders, but other organizations do focus on smallholders and do detect deforestation. So it's, it's possible that you're seeing declines within corporate concessions with increases outside. But will these continue? Uh, next slide. So you've got to kind of look at what's happening in Indonesia and sort of the climate and the kind of emerging threats. Um, one of the biggest issues in the country is that um, Indonesia passed uh, the omnibus law, the job creation law in 2020, which um, was designed to encourage investment and substantially weakened a lot of environmental safeguards. That you know, a lot of things that are happening in the country are happening in the context of this push by the government to encourage investment in the country. And we're kind of, we're, there's a lot of concern about what that will mean. Um, for Indonesia's forests, where a lot of these safeguards have been removed. Um, the failure to extend the palm oil permit moratorium, which um, finished in September last year, I believe it was, and wasn't extended. There was a lot of questions about, you know, is that going to see a new push uh, for new palm oil permits, um, particularly as, as prices increased? Um, we don't know, but it's, it's possible that that will happen. It's all linked to the prices that are rising. We also saw in January this year that over 2,000 uh, licenses for agricultural, forestry, and mining permits were revoked by the government. We've actually found out today that not all of them were revoked. Some of them are still under review, so we, we don't know what we, what's going to happen. Um, and not all of them were revoked uh, because they hadn't developed yet. Some had developed you know, in violation of the rules. Some hadn't um, been compliant with smallholder requirements. Um, we don't really know what's going to happen with that, but the fact that 2,000 um, agricultural concessions were um, revoked, there are big questions about what will happen to them. And the palm oil sector in Indonesia doesn't exist in isolation, so it's not just about what's happening in this sector. You've got um, changes happening in other sectors. You've got uh, revisions to the mining law, the 2010 mining law. Um, they've been revised to make it easier for mining companies to expand uh, mines and extend mining permits. Um, that's obviously going to have quite a big impact on forests, on the environment. Um, you've got the food estate program, which um, has also been linked to deforestation. You've got continued deforestation in Indonesia's industrial tree sector, uh, the pulp and paper sector, it's mainly known as. Uh, we did analysis that showed four companies had cleared 11,000 hectares of forest last year. You've also got this climate of weakening environmental standards. You've got um, a worsening sort of atmosphere for environmental organizations. There's some 
environmental organizations that have, are no longer allowed to operate in Indonesia. Some of the companies um, doing this kind of work, monitoring deforestation, are finding it harder to get visas or to get permission to go into certain areas. So there's a quite a few different things all happening at once that indicate that in the next few years, we might see more deforestation occurring. So even though these um, figures are promising, we've got to be vigilant and we've got to sort of keep the pressure on. Uh, next slide. One of the biggest uh, threats is the domestic biofuel sector. I think everyone is really concerned about the impact this is going to have on deforestation rates. And Aid Environment has worked um, on this sector for quite a while. We had a project focused on increasing sustainability, uh, which was managed by my colleague, uh, Mona Lisa, who is going to take over from me and talk a bit more about the sector and some of the efforts being undertaken. So, Mona? Thank you, Chris. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, the government of Indonesia's biofuel policies was launched in 2008. Initially, it is designed as a mixture of 4% palm oil-based biodiesel or PAME, fatty acid uh, methyl ester, and 99% of diesel fuel, uh, which is also known as the B1 policy. Uh, the uh, figure behind the B uh, shows the percentage of the palm oil based biodiesel in the mix. And this, uh, this policy since launched in 2018 um, doesn't really uh, took off, and the percentage of palm oil in the mix um, are not increased significantly because it's quite slow until in 2016. The mandatory biodiesel uh, policy started with the 20% mix, or known also as B20. So the mandatory biodiesel was actually started with, uh, in part as an effort from the government to improve the demand, domestic demand, uh, to help support the increase in the palm oil price. And at the same time, uh, the government uh, would like to use the biodiesel as the renewable energy in an attempt to achieve net zero emission for it. Um, so the government is targeting 100% uh, biodiesel, or also known as B100, and uh, defense its plan as a way to reduce the dependency on fossil fuels. At the end of 2021, uh, the Indonesian government announced its list of suppliers to achieve mandatory biodiesel target, and the total volume allocated for 2022 is 10 million kilolitres, 6.4% uh, increase versus uh, uh, volume allocated in 2021. Next slide, so here uh, in the table, you can see the Indonesian biofuel plan in million kilolitres. Uh, and the data from Indonesian Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources shows that the Indonesian biofuel plan is not only covering with biodiesel, but also uh, other uh, biofuel, including co-processing green diesel, standalone green diesel, uh, co-processing green gasoline, and standalone green gasoline. But for the, the time being, uh, the mandatory policy is only covered the uh, Biodiesel, and you can see in the figure there from 2021 up to 2040, you can see a steady increase in the targeted uh, plan. Next slide, please. Um, and what 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 happened with the Indonesian mandatory biodiesel target? So the graph here shows you the realization in million kiloliters, and as you can see, the the yellow color is the target. Uh, uh, stated in the national energy Gen general plan and the teal color is the realization for the year um, so you see in 2018 the, the realization is less than targeted and also in 2019 but in 2020 the realization is over uh, from the target uh, the national energy general plan target um, and in 20 also in 2021 and in 2022, the targeted uh, biodiesel is 
uh, higher than the than what is uh, stated in the national energy general plan. And so you can see also here that the mandatory biodiesel target is keep on increasing from year to year up to 2025, where the national energy general plan uh, targeted 13.9 million kiloliter biodiesel. Next slide, please. So, um, where do the government of Indonesia's biodiesel uh, supplied from? Here in the list, you can see the group company where the Indonesia's biodiesel, the Indonesia's biodiesel supply come from. Um, as you can see here, uh, the graph, the table shows the, the name of the group companies and the accumulated volume of biodiesel supplied to Indonesia's domestic market since 2020 in kiloliter. So Wilmar is on top position with over 8 million kiloliter quota from 2020 to 2022, and followed by Musimas and all the way down. Um, we also identified the NDPE status of these suppliers. And as you can see out of uh, 12, you, there are for uh, group companies that currently has no N no NDPD uh, commitment. Um, next slide, please. So if you look at the NDP compliance ratio for biodiesel suppliers from 2020 to 2022, we can see that um, uh, majority of the biodiesel suppliers are coming from companies with NDP commitment which maybe we think would show a positive uh, sign, but then again, uh, the reality on the ground is not always as it seems, because, next slide, please. Um, the Indonesia's biodiesel suppliers are selected by the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources. And currently, there is no domestic sustainability standard for biodiesel. There is a sustainability standard developed since 2016, which is called IPSI or Indonesian Bioenergy Sustainability Indicators, uh, with 10 indicators across three sectors, uh, environmental, social, and economic. Um, but the, these indicators uh, initially include the land use and land use change related to bioenergy feedstock production, but towards the end, it is decided that um, the indicators will omit this land use and land use change related to bioenergy feedstock production because it is already covered under Indonesian Sustainable Palm Oil Policy. Um, however, Indonesian Sustainable Palm Oil Policy, um, the performance is not as expected because as of 31st of March 2021, only 40% of the total areas, uh, total palm oil areas in Indonesia is already uh, included or covered under this uh, Indonesia Sustainable Palm Oil Policy. And also because of uh, lack of domestic sustainability standard for biodiesel, suppliers without NDPE policies that are suspended by other markets are still being selected as suppliers to Indonesia's bio biofuel and biodiesel companies. Um, the other um, challenge also is that because current NDP commitments are still struggling to achieve uh, traceability, traceability to plantation, so it poses a risk of uh, companies uh, supplying biodiesel to Indonesian domestic market are coming from smallholders without NDP policies. Next. And so um, we see that there is an increase uh, from the, uh, the first few slides. We see that there is increased demand for CPO because of the increase in market uh, of mandatory biodiesel. But then also at the same time, uh, we saw also the issue with uh, low productivity because the statistic from Ministry of Agriculture show that Indonesian palm oil yield for 2019 to 2020 is at around 3.8 to 3.94 tons per hectare per year. Under the current rate, uh, the target of 
CPO for biodiesel. Sorry. Yeah, under the current rate, the target of CPO for biodiesel blending will require expansion of land to ensure sufficient food stock. So the table shows you the, uh, the target of biodiesel. We had 100 uh, in million kiloliters, and then how much CPO would be needed to fulfill those biodiesel target. And under the current productivity rate, um, how many uh, areas would be needed to provide for the food stock. And so, yeah, this has uh, created um, a lot of challenges in ensuring the sustainability of Indonesian biodiesel market. And also at the same time, uh, we can show you here an example of where uh, this then becomes problematic. Um, I, will continue, uh, I will pass the next slide to you, please. Okay, thanks, Mona. Uh, next slide, please. So just to get a quick, very quick summary of what that what Mona has described sort of means in practice. Um, so the ministry is setting the selecting the suppliers to the biofuel um, refineries. Um, they don't currently have a sustainability standard or one that doesn't mirror NDP. So John Lin is quite a well-known company in Indonesia. It operates in the palm oil sector and the timber sector. It's operated by an Indonesian businessman called Haji Isan, who's quite well known um, for his coal mining activities in South and East Kalimantan. They've cleared approximately 10,000 hectares of forest in the last five years and have numerous social issues. If you Google that company, you can find some quite um, worrying accusations against them. They're really not a very uh, sustainable company. They've been largely excluded from the NDP market because of this deforestation. The last company that um, was buying from them that had an NDP policy was a Malaysian trader, uh, Sime Darby, and they suspended in 2021. And that was after some efforts by Sime Darby to get John Lin to uh, commit to NDP. Um, John Lin established his own biofuel refinery, uh, PT John Lin Agro Raya, um, last year. And despite all of these known sustainability issues, the refinery was inaugurated by the president of Indonesia, because Haji Assam was a part of the re-election campaign. Um, and John Lin was given a special permit to supply to the biofuel refineries and is now in the list of 2022 suppliers to the refinery. So you've got an Indonesian company that's clearing forests, the traditional approach of using the supply chain pressure and the market access risk to stop deforestation hasn't worked. Why? Probably because John Lin knew that they didn't really need the Sime Darby's, the golden agri-resources of the world, because they were going to build a biofuel refinery and sell to Pertamina. Um, so that, that's a really, really difficult case. I don't think you, you know, to target a company like that to stop that happening is very, very difficult. And the fear is that that will happen with other companies that are clearing forests. They're politically well connected. It doesn't matter that they're suspended by the traditional markets because they'll be able to get a permit for Indonesia's domestic biofuel sector. Um, so yeah, that's, that's um, sort of an overview of what um, we're seeing in the palm oil sector. Now we're going to hand over to Ian from the Gecko Project. Thanks very much, uh, Chris and Mona and Okati. Or Okita, yeah. Um, so uh, from the Gecko Project, we're just going to go through um, Two cases where we've done uh, quite a, I guess, uh, quite a lot of reporting. Um, and these are additional threats to uh, forests in Indonesia. Uh, the first one is this Tanamera case that Chris mentioned um, to, to review, I guess, because um, uh, it's possible some of you are familiar with it. But the Tanamera case is a series of seven concessions in the center of Papua. Uh, the province of Papua. Um, it is altogether at least or almost double the size of Greater London. And if the entire project were to be carried out, then it would release, release the um, 
uh, the amount of emissions that uh, Belgium or I've heard as well as Virginia um, releases in a single year. Now, the, there's a few issues with this uh, project. The first one uh, is around transparency. There's very little known about uh, who's behind this project uh, or these seven projects, because uh, at one point they were one project, at another they were seven separate, there were three separate. And uh, while the Indonesian government has tried to create a rule to um, force companies and government officials to release beneficial ownership information about companies like this. We still have very little information, public information about this. And it, it's also likely or it's possible that the Indonesian government may not know exactly who is behind these projects. Um, and so far in the Tanamara project, I believe something like 9,000 hectares have been cleared and roughly 4,000 of those are already producing. Um, so the oil palm is likely uh, already mature and uh, going somewhere in the oil palm market. Now, this this uh, issue around uh, secrecy is, um, I mean, naturally problematic uh, for people interested uh, in uh, opposition to the project. Uh, there are local officials involved um, who have been uh, keen to promote the project, as well as local officials who have been keen uh, to uh, to stop the project. Uh, and on the on the national level, there are Indonesian ministers and ministries who have separate information about these projects. But uh, if uh, if we are to learn anything more about them, we we just uh, we need more information in in public and. Um, some of the um, uh, some of the, uh, the, or the all seven concessions in this project had their forest release permits canceled by the environment ministry this year in this uh, early January round of hundreds of companies that had similar permits canceled. Now NGOs and activists there have also been a little bit wary about um, uh, praising this action because it's unclear for what reasons these permits uh, across the country were canceled as well as the ones that were uh, in the Tanamera project. Um, and it is also possible that local officials can simply re, re, um, reissue these permits, local officials plus the uh, national officials. Um, so it's unclear exactly what's going to happen now. And, in at least one case, uh, also in the, I think in the province of West Papua, uh, there was a, uh, no, sorry, it, it was in the province of Papua. Uh, there was a company who did have some more permits canceled, but was also found to be clearing forest after those permits were canceled this year. So it's unclear whether this will actually have any effect at all. And to reiterate, there's little information about the Town of Mayor project, and if we are to learn about the largest, potentially largest palm oil project in the world. Uh, there must be a lot more transparency. <laughs> so we have also recently been doing a lot of work in the food estate program, which Chris also mentions. This was a program that was launched in the early months of the pandemic. Uh, and it had been spoken of um, for years. Uh, this is often a kind of a perennial interest of uh, government officials in Indonesia that there is definitely a, um, uh, an issue, or there are issues with access to food and malnutrition. And several times in Indonesia's history, uh, officials have attempted to create expanses of land that would be able to produce more food for citizens, with the hope that it would increase uh, access to that food and uh, reduce malnutrition and boost citizens, uh, uh, I guess, standards of living in the country. Um, now, when we began to investigate it, there was a series of issues and our investigation last year highlighted these. 
um, centered around the Ministry of Defense, which uh, is not a ministry that people often think of when they think of agriculture or food. Now, some of the issues that uh, NGOs and lawyers and government officials have brought up have been uh, about the regulations and about policy and within regulations. Shortly after the program was uh, announced, there were a series of documents that were released. There were a series of statements that worried some, uh, some observers in the industry uh, because it was atypical. It was strange to have a government policy without regulations and have actions stipulated in documents that weren't uh, bound by law and weren't official. Um, and some of these regulations, uh, uh, when, they were in, when they were finally released in November, they mentioned, and actually before that as well, uh, which uh, began to worry some people as early as June, um, there was this hint of a rapid uh, strategic environmental survey or study uh, called, called a uh, Carl Hayes. And this, uh, these kinds of documents were the highlight of a lot of criticism because the, this rapid Carl Hayes meant to um, replace the, the standard Carl Hayes, which is like a, a, I guess, a simple study that is conducted by companies when they look to clear land or they look to plant or they look to, to build large, um, uh, factories and things like this. Uh, but this rapid Carajas was simply mentioned in regulations, but it wasn't articulated in law. It wasn't described what the uh, requirements were. Uh, it was simply mentioned and then um, uh, uh, it was left at that. So the issue there was that, oops, is that um, when they do apply with this Cajas, the officials are the ones in charge of dictating, or sorry, are applying for um, land that should be designated as food estate areas. Um, and when they do this, they have to work closely with companies. So among the requirements for uh, turning a plot of land into a food estate area uh, was, or were, several company plans uh, regarding planting, regarding selling, regarding uh, a whole host of things. Um, however, this many of those plans were also just uh, commitments. So they could be produced up to two years after the land was designated as a food estate area. Um, and then within those regulations, there were, uh, I guess I would say loopholes to access protected forests. And in fact, the very first food estate regulation that came out mentioned that specifically, if a uh, if a protected forest was, uh, I guess, was no longer serving, I believe the language was no longer serving as a protected forest, whatever that may mean, then it could be designated as a food as a food estate. And many people brought issues with that because uh, how do you designate? How do you define uh, whether a protected forest is no longer serving its role? And in a subsequent regulation in 2021, the Environment Ministry clarified that uh, protected forests that were no longer serving could be issued or could be redesignated as food estate areas, meaning open to agricultural plantations, if uh, they were first rehabilitated. Um, and that also struck a lot of people as uh, a little a little strange um, because these areas would be rehabilitated and then they would be cut down and planted. Um, and the uh, the definitions for rehabilitations were also not um, articulated. So then within policy, what um, before these regulations were issued, it was already clear that the um, the leaders of this program, uh, including Jacoby, President Jacoby, um, they created a national food agency that was in charge of a whole host of foods like rice and corn, but they left out one critical food, 
and later it showed up that the Ministry of Defense would be in charge of cassava, this fruit, vegetable, tasty stuff that is often the, a staple of, uh, I guess, Maluku diets. Um, and uh, it, it was as if the, the Ministry of Defense had its own slice of the food estate program carved out for them. So as you can see in this uh, picture, they showed up in Gunumas uh, very early on, this uh, district in central Kalimantan. And when we began tracking what they were doing in this province, uh, they had slated an area in, in the district, roughly 30,000 hectares for a cassava plantation run by the Ministry of Defense. And two weeks after, the first food estate regulation was issued. They began clearing forest in that area, uh, roughly 630 hectares, if I remember correctly. Um, and this is an area that is also already uh, known by the environment ministry to be home to orangutans. Um, it was unclear. Uh, why they were doing this. It was unclear who exactly was behind it. Um, when we visited, there were officials, uh, including soldiers, military officials, who mentioned that there was one specific company named Agrinas behind it. And this is a slide from a presentation that we found that appears to be from Agrinas, and the metadata also. Um, supports that theory. It appears to be from Agronas and to the South Korean um, ambassador uh, asking for investment in a cassava project in central Kalimantan. Um, when we asked Agronas and the Ministry of Defense about this, they both denied that there was any connection between the two. Um, However, there are two key elements in this presentation. One is that Agronas boasts a close relationship with Minister Proboa, and strangely, they boast that their project could improve South Korea's food security, whereas the food estate program was meant to improve Indonesia's. Now, uh, yeah, again, the Ministry of Defense has uh, denied any connection here, and the project in central Kalimantan um, has, when we visited in August, they had planted roughly 30 hectares of cassava, but uh, some of it was not being taken care of, it seems, some of it was wilting. Um, it doesn't seem that much more has happened in that area since then. Uh, I think it's also valuable to note that a cassava plantation, according to an expert that we, an expert in cassava, that we talked to um, is unheard of in the industry. Cassava is uh, best when it is tended to by, uh, by a farmer individually, meaning that it's a smallholder crop. But, uh, it's very rare that plantations larger than a few hundred hectares would survive or be successful. But the proposal here was 30,000 hectares. And just to um, to highlight the, the company of Agronas, um, it was tied to Provo Subianto directly through, uh, through its foundation. The foundation uh, owns Agronas wholly, and uh, this is a Ministry of Defense foundation that was originally set up to be, uh, to promote education for retired officials and their kids. And uh, it is, yeah, it is um, since uh, created the company Agronas uh, in early 2020. And the uh, officials on this board are linked to his, uh, his uh, political party, Garindra. So th this, Mohammed Arpin told us that this seemed to be like a death triangle. The foundation, Agronas plus the Ministry of Defense. Now, when we um, traced this Agronas company further, they seem to appear in Papua. There was a military official traveling around Papua in uh, late 2020, early 2021, 
offering to local communities that and officials that uh, a, the food estate program could be an economic boon for certain areas um, because local uh, citizens could, uh, I guess, be recruited into this new military um, reserve called Comtrad and they, um, the, the military official there said that Agronas would be behind the project if everything went smoothly. But it, it was hard to get very many details there because uh, company plans were also not shared with locals, uh, even on an online seminar where the plans were, were offered to local officials, there were uh, no uh, local communities present or invited. Now, yeah, it's hard to get information about this, but since our investigation, there have been a few more data points that have come out about the major threat to Papua uh, from the food estate. And this is one from Awas uh, uh, Mithi, the, the previous uh, food estate program. And uh, in, uh, yeah, in 2021, the, uh, Papuan government, I believe, uh, and uh, from these, from a central ministry as well, released part of these plans, which highlighted that uh, many more hectares, up to 2 million hectares of forest areas, or I believe it's 1.3 hectares of actual forest areas, uh, plus the Apeo, um, uh, were also slated uh, for the food estate program. And a lot of these maps don't seem to line up um, uh, exactly. So it's hard to tell where exactly the plans are, uh, where they're coming from, who's uh, promoting them, who has applied for these food estate areas. And I'll note that uh, more recently, the, uh, the yeah, NGO Pusaka calculated that of a recent plan for food estate areas in Papua, um, if the area were to be cleared for rice paddy, for cassava, for various other foods, uh, it, it could release the emissions equivalent to Australia's uh, annual emissions. So again, there's, it seems that Papua has become the focus of the uh, more recent food estate developments. And I understand there's also a lot in Southern Central Kalimantan as well as North Sumatra and their varying results from farmers in those areas regarding whether they can produce uh, the same amount that they could produce on their own, um, how companies are taking over the process. And uh, regarding forests, it seems that uh, the major threat is becoming quickly Papua. But again, uh, not much has happened yet. So we don't know where area will be cleared, who will be clearing the area, um, or even if, uh, these could all just be plans. So I'll hand it back to the team at uh, Chain Reaction Research. Great, uh, thanks a lot, Ian. We, I really appreciate your presentation. Thanks to all of our presenters, uh, presenters today. Um, we just have a few minutes for uh, Q&A. Um, so I'd like to start with one for Chris. Um, can you say a bit more about NDP commitments in the palm oil? market, uh, are they working or not? And are we risking a bifurcated market? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. The, the answer is yes to both of them. They, they've really worked. Um, if you look at where the industry was and where it is now, it's completely different. And the industry is dominated by NDP policies. So the last um, analysis we did was a couple of years ago, two, two years ago. and. We looked at refining capacity in Indonesia and Malaysia where most takes place and 83% of refining capacity is covered by NDP policies. It falls uh, when you start adding in key performance indicators, but there are so many examples of um, forest on concessions that have been, have been saved because of the work of the buyers. And um, it's really transformed the industry. We always knew 
the, the leakage market, the, the market that didn't have policies was the biggest threat to this. And that's why um, Chain Reaction Research and other organizations really focused on these leakage refiners. And we've had quite a lot of success. Like some of the ones that we, that had never really been interested in becoming NDP did slowly come in. And I was, we've tried to assess why. I was often told that, um, you know, the NDP market does offer better conditions, it offers um, better prices, more stable income. So people do really want to be in that NDP market. But the fact that there is that leakage market has always presented the biggest risk. Um, and now with biofuels, you've got a very, very key leakage market domestically. You've also got com uh, countries like South Korea and Japan that we would also consider the key leakage markets. Um, so I think that the success that you're seeing in the industry, the, the reduction in deforest deforestation rates is linked to the success of the NDP policies in, um, in the sector. The leakage market is a huge threat. I think it's probably going to get bigger with the threat of biofuels. And that's why we're focusing so much on um, working with the ministry to try and get an NDP policy, um, policy sort of for them to apply to their suppliers. Because if, if the, even if it's not as good as NDPE, even if there's some, um, some kind of policy that mirrors it, that will have such an impact on, on, de on the deforestation, the kind of concessions that are allowed to enter the biofuel refineries. Um, but it, it requires a shift in focus because, yeah, we've had success with leakage refiners in the past. We haven't had that much success with domestic Indonesian leakage refiners. I think the, the biggest holdout is Best Group, one of the biggest Indonesian refiners. We've had some success because some of their buyers, like Louis Dreyfus Company, um, have really engaged with them and they've lost a lot of market access and they're slowly coming in, but it, it's really, really hard and it's a domestic uh, refiner. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I, yeah, it's, it's had a, a really huge impact on, on the sector. Thanks a lot for that answer, Chris. And um, unfortunately, we don't have any, we're at the hour, so we don't have any more time for uh, Q&A, but if anyone has any follow-up questions, our emails are there on the screen. Please don't hesitate to um, get in touch with us. So thanks for everybody for attending this presentation. We'll have a recording on our website in the coming days. We hope to see everyone again at a future event of ours. Thanks again.